Happy Friday. Welcome inside Mr. Small's Theater. This is Geik's Got Game. I'm your host, Matt Geik, on the River's Edge. You can find us at riversedgepgh.com. Likely you have found us if you are accessing this show. But if you've stumbled upon the Facebook Live broadcast, that's what we're all about here. It's the, excuse me, the audio stream, the live stream there in addition to, <clears throat> as I clear my throat here, woo, rough start on this day. But uh, we're all about live music, live talk, local music, local talk, and this show is just a part of a vast tapestry here at the River's Edge, now located up on the hill in Millvale. I'm alongside my producer, Tyler Zelenko, for this Friday morning, and thank you so much for joining us. We've got so much coming up for you. I like to call this a new kind of sports talk for a new kind of radio, and as such, we'll talk about some big picture issues here. Regarding the Penguins, how much do you really want that three-peat? I'm sensing not as much uh, fervence over the uh, the Penguins, if that's a word. <laughs> not as much passion about this team's stretch run. Maybe it's just because they're going to make the playoffs and you're just waiting to really get engaged until the second week of April, which I would totally understand. But I'll dig into that a bit deeper in just a bit. Also coming up, a dead zone in Pittsburgh sports, just generally – the Steelers, of course, still a ways away from doing anything of significance. If you're a draft nut, which I am not, but if you are, you're thinking about that. But we're still uh, a month or so out from any kind of uh, intense scenarios on what they will do or what they won't do. And uh, I know that is usually enough, just some innuendo and some uh, random reports here or there to get most football fans fired up. But as far as actual play on the, the field or on the ice uh, or on the court, as we've seen with March Madness, in the recent days and, and weeks, there isn't a lot going on that's very relevant to, uh, to Pittsburgh sports. Just the Penguins on the ice, and like I said, not a ton at stake right now. So what do you do? How do we get through it? I'll try to fire off some coping mechanisms for you there. And finally, speaking of March Madness, in my opinion, there are diminishing returns with the way that college basketball has gone, and you still can enjoy it, but... There isn't that deeper meaning to upsets. Uh, there isn't that greater significance to it that I think there used to be, and, and there are reasons for that. But now, as we move into a, kind of a different era in college basketball, this has been, well, uh, it's been a tournament full of upsets. We had a 16 over a 1 for the first time. But the more upsets you have, do they lose some significance there? I think they do, and I'll get into that later on in this hour. You can find me on Twitter and Facebook at Matt Geitka, M-A-T-T-G-A-J-T-K-A. You can fire off your thoughts, potential topics. I'll address those on our Facebook page right now um, on our River's Edge Facebook page. River's Edge PGH is the suffix there on Facebook, and also Matt Geitka Media, G-A-J-T-K-A, again, is how you spell my last name, and you can find the cross links on River's Edge, just in case uh, you weren't a spelling bee champion, which you might need to be to get my name right. Anyway, are you driven for more? That's the Penguins marketing slogan this year, and it's a good one. It fits, because clearly, this team is still positioned to challenge for championships, and I've talked about it. Since the start of January, this is looking more and more like a legitimate championship contending team, not just because of what they've done the last two years, but because they have been playing better. And they've gone up and down since the trade deadline. It has been a, uh, a minefield in some ways, navigating different uh, players in different spots, the acquisition of Derek Broussard, the trade of Ian Cole away from town. Those are two pretty significant moves, but I discussed that already, how the adjustment period has lasted a bit longer uh, than I thought it might. In this case, so mea culpa in that situation. I don't think there's anything that's going to hold this team back from getting it meshed together for the start of the playoffs, and still several games left to go. Uh, starting with tonight's game against the Devils at PPG Paints Arena, which I'll be covering for PittsburghHockeyNow.com. Devils and Flyers, in fact, this weekend. Maybe that'll get some people ginned up and ready to go. I don't know if it'll really trigger the emotions of a playoff run, but with the Flyers and the Devils still on the heels of the Penguins in the Metropolitan Division, perhaps that inspires some urgency. But urgency gen generally feels missing from the whole scene surrounding this team, whether it be on the ice at times, and yeah, they've been guilty of that, the players themselves, but also 
if I can put my fan hat on and I still try to maintain those fan sensibilities and realize what people want to read, what they want to listen to, what they want to see. I think that's smart <laughs> if you're in the sports media business, but it's also genuine. That's where I come from. I started as a fan before I had this career at all. And I know that if I refer to my internal fan compass here, which I like to do a lot, and I think about the last two seasons, yeah, this season does feel different because in 2016 it was about the Penguins of Crosby and Malkin and Marc-Andre Fleury and uh, Chris Letang, that core group regrouping and uh, finding a new way to play under their new coach, Mike Sullivan, with the general manager, Jim Rutherford, tailoring the team for speed and skill as opposed to grit and toughness, which he tried to do in his first season in charge. Didn't quite work out. All of that succeeded in doing was making the Penguins slower in 2014-15, and uh, their former coach had a lot to do with that too, Mike Johnston. But in 15-16, there was a great deal of urgency there. The Penguins had already wasted how many years? Seven years between the 2009 Cup and 2016. So it felt like with Crosby and Malkin getting toward their late 20s, in their late 20s in fact, that the time to strike was then. And those playoff games against well, the Rangers to get some vengeance for playoff losses in the, in the previous two spring times, that was significant to beat Henrik Lundqvist and chase him out of the net in one of those playoff games, that was significant. And then to get past the Capitals, not that that's been a struggle for the Penguins historically, but the Capitals were President's Trophy winners that year, and the Capitals were also looking like the team to come to the forefront. They were looking like they were the, the team of the late aughts, the late 2000s, that were going to get it together. And, uh, well, they nearly did, except for a couple of close losses in that second-round series and for the Pens to get Beyond that, and then to face a new challenger in the Tampa Bay Lightning, to extinguish them, to take care of them. And then the San Jose Sharks in the final, that felt like the Penguins were the better team. Even that one took six games. But there was uh, emotion galore in that playoff run. And late down the stretch in 2015-16, this was a team that was flirting with missing the playoffs, that made a coaching change, that reconfigured its lineup. All of that came together, and this was finally starting to look like a team, and it did look like a team that was going to make a push for a title. We hadn't seen that in Pittsburgh perhaps since the 2013 season when they reeled off 15 in a row late in the year. So uh, that team felt like it had to get it done. If that team didn't get it done, I don't know when it was going to happen for the Pens, and they did. They won the championship. They got that second cup. It validated a lot of things, not just for the Penguins, but also for Crosby and Malkin. Uh, not just for the Penguins in general, I mean, but also Crosby, Malkin, some individuals there that had been labeled with the uh, underachiever tag. That was no more. When you win a second cup and you get to that point, when you're a multiple championship winner, that was huge. And then last year, you heard so much that teams don't repeat, they can't repeat in the salary cap era. Well, the Penguins, in a different way, in a counterattacking, opportunistic way in the playoffs with some great goaltending last year, they did get it done. They got there again. I always felt like that was karmic payback for, say, the 2011-12 team, uh, the 2010-11 team that had Crosby and Malkin at the height of their powers, but then Crosby and Malkin both went out with season-ending injuries, and that always struck me as a huge missed opportunity. Those are really good teams. Let's not besmirch Ray Shiro and Dan Bilesma that much because there was some bad injury luck there mixed in right after they won that first Stanley Cup. But to get the third Cup, to go back-to-back, -back, more importantly, that felt like something that fans got behind. But I don't know if the three-peat has necessarily done it. And in talking to fans and talking to well, people in my own family, like my brother, for instance, I haven't met a bigger Penguins fan, but he admits that he has had a hard time getting fired up for these games and uh, feeling like he was totally engaged. When you go deep in the playoffs back-to-back -back years, that's a lot of time and energy and, and, uh, and passion committed to a team. And... Uh, I think you can forgive people, you can forgive players even, but you can forgive people and fans for not totally being locked in on the team in October and November and December. But I think some of that's carried over until now. And I wonder how it's going to be once the playoffs start. Do fans just flip that switch? Do they go right back into nutso mode? Do they uh, make it the most important thing of their day? For me, I think it does happen. I still think this Fan base wants to see this team win more. Uh, you always want to see a team win more, I suppose. But when you win championships, there is a, that natural phenomenon of feeling satisfied. And when you win back-to-back, -back, which hasn't been done around here in Pittsburgh 
since the 1991-92 Penguins. We've seen it a few times in, um, in local sports. The Steelers did it twice in the 70s. The Penguins have now done it twice, too. And I don't recall, I wasn't old enough to remember what the 1992-93 season was like for the Penguins. They were outstanding. They were dynamic. It might have been the best team of that stretch. It might be the best team in franchise history. Um, if you look at uh, strength of, of the lineup, total depth, um, how they blew away the league, I'm not even sure that's possible now in this era of parity and a salary cap. And well, those Penguins probably... Uh, emptied the tank for Howard Baldwin and the ownership group back then and led to some bankruptcy issues that they faced. So um, perhaps that was unwise to pour that much into it, but at the time, I'm sure it felt, it felt pretty right. And this team, while not having that level of uh, superstars up and down the lineup, you still have Crosby, Malkin, and Phil Kessel playing the best hockey of his career. And you have Matt Murray, who's won back-to-back cups. <clears throat> Excuse me while still having rookie status in the NHL. So, yeah, there are stars here, and there is history at stake. But it's been a slow burn this year, and there have been moments where the fan base has gotten more upset than excited. That's at least my feel for it. That's the people I'm following on social media. Perhaps that's my selection bias in this case, and I'm not experiencing it as I could. And I'll admit that when you do get into this professionally, you kind of get cordoned off from the fan base. You don't quite have the same finger on the pulse that you might have in seasons past. And like I said, I've tried to keep that. But I'm wondering, um, for all of you out there, is this still an important thing? Do you still have the burning desire to see a third Stanley Cup? Or was it enough the last two years? And maybe they'll challenge for one this year or next year or the year after that. But overall, you're feeling pretty good about the way things are going. Anyway, you can put your comments down there on the on the post on Facebook. I see Jill Schrott has chimed in with a happy belated birthday. Yes, I turned 33 yesterday. That inspired some reflection, and I'll get into that later on the program. You can also tweet me at Matt Geitka, M-A-T-T-G-A-J-T-K-A. Try to get my voice, <clears throat> excuse me, sorted out here at the break here on the River's Edge. Coming up next, talking about the dead zone in Pittsburgh sports we're in and how we can find some fun in, uh, in what's going on right now, of course, offseason for football, the optimism for the Pirates, the excitement for the Pirates might be at an all-time low uh, that I can remember at the current moment. And also, like I said, the Penguins still just biding their time, and their fans, I think, biding their time for the postseason to start. This is Geek's Guy Game. You are watching and listening on The River's Edge. Stay clear of the streets, for God's sake! The timid and the fearful drivers are every bit as bad as the aggressive drivers. Nobody in Pittsburgh knows what a right-of-way is. I go down the road and I just sing this song, the gas is on the right, the gas is on the right, hi-ho the highway, yo! The gas is on the right. Get educated with Brian Crawford live Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 10 a.m. here on the River's Edge. Good morning from Millville, Pennsylvania. I'm here at Mr. Small's Theater. I am Matt Geica. Is the snow over? I think it is. I think we're ready to move on to springtime officially. It is technically spring. Some snow on the ground, but it's melting quickly. That's the good part about it this time of year. You know what, though? I thought it was our best snow of the year, at least in one case. It made everything look really pretty before we move on to, uh, to bigger and better things here in 2018. I was just down in Bradenton as you... Maybe uh, tune into the show last week. You gathered that as James Santelli. Thanks to him for carrying the uh, the baton for the hour last Friday. But I was in Florida for some uh, Pirate Spring training coverage on PiratesProspects.com. Give that site a look. I think we're doing some good stuff over there. But I can't really complain about it, even though it was quite the jarring experience to go from 75 and sunny to 30. And like I said, a significant snowfall. Outstanding outstanding uh, <laughs> stuff at both ends of it. I like, I like winter, and I've had this discussion with Brian Crawford a few times when he's engineered the show. He doesn't. I do. But at this time of the year, I'm ready to move on. I went down a, a, a rabbit hole of big storms in, in, the, in March in the past, and the blizzard of 93 is one that stands out to me. I was just eight years old back then, and loving every minute of it. I think the snow drifts were taller than I was at that point. Uh, this wasn't quite to that effect, but we've had some big nor'easters blow through, and uh, well, we haven't really gotten it that bad. Our our friends out in Boston and New York and New Jersey and New England and all of that—they've been hammered. So 
there's always someone who has it worse than you, I suppose, is the perspective that I'll bring to the table here on Geek Sky Game. Talking sports ostensibly here on this program, talking about how bad you won a third Stanley Cup. I don't know if I sense the same level of passion, but it's only natural, right? Um, and when I say the same level of passion, I'm talking about from the fans. I don't know uh, the players. There are certain players on the Penguins right now who have never done it, of course, right? Derek Broussard has been to a Stanley Cup final as the number one centerman, by the way, with the New York Rangers in 2014. They lost to the Kings in five games, so he didn't get particularly close in the final series, but there are players out there who would die to uh, make it to the championship round. He has. He had a taste of it, and uh, now he's back in the mix. I think it's wise to have a couple of guys like that, even though um, it's not always practical to really turn over an entire roster after you won back-to-back cups. You don't necessarily want to. I'm sure if Jim Rutherford had his druthers, he would have kept Matt Cullen, but that was Cullen's decision to move on. He might have even kept Nick Benino, even though I would have advised otherwise to move on from him. Uh, but the fact is, you you take what you have and uh, you go with it. And you know you try to position things as positives when you can, if you are a team. But as a fan base, all of you, well, for the most part, all of you, unless you're really young or you just got on the Pen- Penguins bandwagon, if that's the case, what were you waiting for? But <laughs> well, most of us have all experienced Stanley Cups in the last two years. So where's your level of energy and enthusiasm? Again, let me know on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, I'll fire back at you. I'll let you know what I think about what you have to say. A greater point, though, to make here on uh, on this March the 23rd, 2018, as we work our way toward the end of the NHL regular season, is we find ourselves in a dead zone in Pittsburgh sports. There are no basketball teams alive uh, in the NCAA tournament. Robert Morris hockey, unfortunately, fell one win shy of making it to the uh, the, the hockey tournament, hockey's version of March Madness. If you are a Penn State fan, I don't want to rule those folks out. If you're a Penn State fan, that your Nittany Lions are in the, uh, the hockey tournament. They're in the Sweet 16, if you will, for the second consecutive year. They're playing out in Allentown, in fact, tomorrow against Denver, the team that knocked them out last year. So there's an exception. If you're a Penn State fan, you have something going on. You have a lot at stake. But for right now, generally, for people in this area, yeah, you're, you're probably wondering, well, what can I pull for? What can I get engaged in? Now, for the Penguins fans out there, there's probably nothing I can tell you right now that can get you really excited for the end of the season, unless you're really into playoff matchups. If you're pulling for, say, Penguins Flyers, which we haven't seen since the 2012 season, and what a playoff series that was, even though the Penguins came out on the short end. If you're looking for that, that level of enthusiasm and that rekindling of the rivalry, then, uh, well, that's one thing you can look to. And there's a great website out there called Sports Club Stats that I refer to very often at this time of year. Really, I only visit at this time of year. No offense to the people who run it, but this, this is when it's most relevant. And the Penguins haven't locked up a playoff spot, but we're in a position now as observers of the team where we can start looking at potential playoff matchups. And as of just a little bit ago, the Flyers were the Penguins' most likely first-round matchup. But now, with the Columbus Blue Jackets having won 10 in a row, that Jackets feud might be rekindled here. The Penguins, according to Sports Club stats, again, for entertainment purposes only, uh, this is all based on season simulations and and probabilities. But the Penguins have a 47% chance, nearly a half uh, of all outcomes have resulted in the Pens and the Jackets getting together again. A third I-70 series. I would love it. I think it's great for the sport. I think it's great for both fan bases, um, especially the one in Columbus. They have a real little brother thing going on with the Penguins, and uh, it was enjoyable being out there last year to cover the playoffs, the start of the playoffs for DK Pittsburgh Sports, my former employer, uh, just to experience Nationwide Arena and how hungry they are. Talk about a hungry fan base. That fan base is desperate for success in the postseason. They've never won a playoff round. They've lost to the Penguins in the first round the last two times they've been in. That would be a minefield, that first round series. And it's looking more and more likely, whether it be starting in Pittsburgh or starting in Columbus, the two teams are currently tied for second place in the Metro division. So that 2-3 matchup in the Metro could very easily be pens and jackets. Flyers, though, don't rule it out. And that would be fun too, right? 31% 
chance for Philly. It's almost down to those two because you look at other teams. If the Penguins fall down the standings, they could face the Capitals 10% chance in the first round. We haven't seen Penn's Caps in the first round. Sorry about that. We haven't seen Penn's Caps in the first round. I'm a little clumsy this morning. Maybe I need more caffeine. Uh, since when? Gosh, it's been looking all the way back to, was it really? 2000 that uh, was the last time the Pens and the Caps played right at the start of the postseason. It had to have been uh, because that was uh, the memorable series when Marty Straka stole the puck off of future Penguin Sergei Gonchar and won it on the breakaway. Uh, at those times... It was Penn's caps a lot in the first round. Recently, it's been second round, as it has the last three times, all three times that they've played in the Crosby-Ovechkin era. It's been like that. But we could see it in the first round this time. Also, outside chances for Florida and New Jersey, 5% apiece, according to that. So who do you want to see if you're a Penguins fan? Maybe that's the intrigue, and that is the excitement that you can consider here as the Pens head down the stretch. Eight games left for him, counting... This weekend, two games at home. As I mentioned, New Jersey, desperate to get into the playoffs. They haven't been there in a while. This is a totally new group. They've had a great season. They've fallen off lately. Ben Lovejoy, I was just reading a report from NJ.com. Ben Lovejoy, the former Penguin, addressed the Devils yesterday, saying that they're this close. You've got to find a way to find your best game. And if you're looking at motivation, yeah, the Devils are going to be more motivated tonight. And the Flyers have uh, had a a rough month of March after a terrific February. So um, it's not going to get much easier for the Penguins. They're going to be facing teams that have a little more to prove or a lot more to prove in the coming days and weeks. And it's not always going to be like it was against Montreal where both teams were essentially playing for pride, if you want to put it that way. The Penguins playing for more than that. Obviously, they want to get their game together. But um, nothing much tangibly at stake in that matchup the other night. At home, And that's the challenge right now for a team that's won back-to-back cups. This might be the most grueling stretch of the season because, A, you don't want to get hurt, but, B, you want to play your best. You want to get those good habits ingrained. And they had them going for a while. It's been hit and miss ever since. So that's what you have to look forward to if you're a Penguins fan. How about if you're a Pirates fan? How about if you, you still have stuck with this team through thick and mostly thin in the last two years? Well, having just been down in Bradenton, I know – at least from one aspect of it, from the uh, refreshment side of, of things, there are some new players to root for, some new players to get into and get excited about, in addition to having some of the old reliables, like Josh Harrison and, and Jordy Mercer up the middle, just to name a couple. Starling Marte and Gregory Polanco, they have plenty to prove. We're talking about teams to prove in the NHL. Those two guys have a lot to prove individually. It's time for them to get it going. So those are primary storylines. They have to carry this team especially with McCutcheon and Cole traded off. It's time for those two, Marte and Polanco, to fulfill their promise, or else the Pirates are going to have a hard time scoring runs this season, or preventing them, if you look at the defensive side of it, in the outfield. You have a young rotation, Yvonne Nova accepted, but you have Jamison Tayo, and you have Chad Cool and Trevor Williams, potentially Joe Musgrove. You might see Tyler Glass now step up and get a chance here this season. So along with the uncertainty of the Pirates compared to the certainty of the Penguins uh, making the playoffs. There's a great deal of uncertainty with the Pirates. It's the opposite side of the spectrum there. Maybe it's too much uncertainty for some people. Maybe that's part of the reason why, for instance, opening day is still not sold out at PNC Park. That would be a first in the history of that ballpark uh, for opening day to still be featuring some empty seats. I know my parents were able to buy some tickets a couple of weeks ago. No problem. I was semi-surprised at that. Because opening day, no matter what the team looks like or what it feels like it's going to do, has always been a real draw around these parts. No matter how bad the weather is, and it's usually pretty bad <laughs> at the start of April. Or in this case, well, they don't start on at home. But, um, for instance, if you're a Detroit Tigers fan, the season starts at home on, what, March 28th. So, yeah, not likely to be a, a fantastic fan experience as far as your comfort is concerned. But baseball is back, whether it be here or there or el- elsewhere, anywhere across Major League Baseball, but Pirates fans, probably because of the way that um, ownership has handled this offseason, there's just not a lot of excitement there. So what do you get fired up for? What do you look forward to? Well, I just gave you some options in those cases. Felipe Rivero, maybe one of the best relievers in the National League, if not all of Major League Baseball. There are some things to look at. And 
once the regular season gets started for the Pirates, I think we will start to see more engagement once the uh, the real bullets start flying, pardon the expression, but um, it's true. Once the games do start, it's it's pretty easy to get into it if you are an actual baseball fan, not just a, a casual fan of Pittsburgh sports. Um, if you are, you probably disengaged from the Pirates over the past two years. But yeah, baseball, I find it's been really interesting for me to experience spring training firsthand because it feels really urgent and it feels really interesting and cool when you're down there. But it's really easy to just ignore it when you're up north. And you can look on vicariously and see uh, sunny skies and palm trees blowing in the breeze. But if you just watch it on TV or if you're just reading accounts of it, yeah, it's, it's really easy to forget that baseball is around the corner and it's easy to forget that uh, they're getting close to the season. Whereas with hockey and football, they play the preseason here in town and uh, it feels more urgent and it feels more imminent than it does in baseball. So baseball is more of a, all of a sudden it jumps on you at this time of the year. And I think that's part of the reason too, why um, just generally speaking, I, I feel like it's a bit of a down period for Pittsburgh sports enthusiasm. It's a great sports town, but sometimes it's a gift and a curse being a great sports town because so many fans are savvy and they realize when they have to pay attention and they realize when they don't. Um, that experience can go both ways. It can also take away from the enthusiasm in certain spots. And uh, like I said, not much going on in the realm of football. The Steelers are, oh, they, they just made a, a move in free agency, but they very rarely make a splash. So it's not like you're anticipating that either. Uh, this has, when the Penguins have been good and have been locked into a playoff spot at this time of the year, or when they've been completely out of it, this has always been a dead period to navigate before you get on to April and things start to get really exciting, which they should, I think, at least on the ice and maybe even down at PNC Park and wherever the Pirates Maybe teeing it up. This is Geik's Got Game. Always exciting, I hope, for you to listen and watch on the River's Edge. You can find us at riversedgepgh.com. I'm your host, Matt Geitka. Tyler Zelenko is alongside engineering the program. When I come back, I want to talk about what I feel are diminishing returns for March Madness, for the NCAA basketball tournament. Um, I've been falling out of love with the revenue sports in college anyway. Now, I have my alma mater involved this year. That mitigated that. Uh, process, maybe a bit of a hypocrite, I think, but um, just when I look at this tournament, I am uh, I'm feeling less engaged with it the further it goes along, and you would think, you would hope, most things you want the excitement to continue onward and upward as the, the bracket develops, but in the case of March Madness now, it's, it's the opposite, and I'm not sure there's any way out of it, and maybe the NCAA doesn't really care. They feel like they have a good thing going. We'll dig into that further on the other side of this break, live from Millvale. Hi, I'm Mike Storr, host of The Awesome Cast, which you can hear right here on River's Edge Radio. We're talking tech, getting geeky every week with people from Pittsburgh in the industry. Go check us out, awesomecast.net, or listen to us right here on River's Edge Radio, Thursday mornings, 8 a.m. after Funny Money. It's been a little touch and go from <clears throat> Mr. Small's Theater as you hear my voice is failing me today and uh, well I've knocked the microphone around <laughs> trying to figure things out by the time I get to the end of the hour I'm sure I should be good to go <laughs> isn't that funny how it always works out that way anyway thank you for watching I mentioned Facebook but you can also find the live stream on Rivers Edge pgh.com slash live we have the embed there from the Facebook video so we prefer you go there because then you can find all of our content whether it be on the 24-hour uh, audio stream or the podcasts. Also, you can figure out, you can find out how to support us, learn a little bit more about the station. I've been here, it'll be three years in, in June, so it's been spectacular to be joining you once a week, almost, give or take, whether it be I call in or I host the show myself. Uh, last week was an exception, busy down in Bradenton with Pirate Spring Training. And thank you again to James Santelli for stepping in. This is Geik's Got Game. We're talking about where do you find the excitement right now if you're a Pittsburgh sports fan? No Steelers, of course, in the offseason. If you're a draft nut, God bless you, but I can't really get into that sort of thing. Uh, the Pirates haven't started playing, and they don't have a lot of excitement in general surrounding them. And the Penguins are just waiting for the playoffs. At least that's what it feels like right now. Well, I got a lot of feedback from folks talking about whether they feel that uh, the three-peat is, uh, is urgent and necessary to them. Hunter Hodes 
chimes in. He says, I hate losing more than I love to win. I've heard that before. I actually love to win more than I hate to lose. Uh, maybe I'm different in that way. But he says, so yeah, I'd want another just because you don't want to lose in the playoffs. That's extremely painful. Hunter says, though, but if they lose, oh, well, there's next year. I think that is a rational take, right, at this point. I feel like it's gravy as a fan. If I just put my fan hat on for right now, they just won back-to-back. I don't need it like I needed it, like I said, in 2016. Even last year had more urgency than I thought it would just because of the opportunity to make history and repeat. Yeah, three-peat would be even more history, but on a level of magnitude, from one to two is huge. From two to three is less huge. That's the way I feel about it mentally. Jonathan Plan says, don't call it the three-peat. Call it the treble in European football, European footy. Yeah, that's what they say over there. Although treble, isn't that more like when uh, Man U won the treble way back when, uh, about 15 years ago? Or so that was the Premier League, uh, the Champions League, and FA Cup. I thought that it was like three different championships in one year was the treble. Maybe you can apply it to different situations. But Jonathan continues on. He says, You can't ask for three. I think some people are, but I think most aren't. I agree. But yes, it would be great, says Jonathan. And some birthday wishes on there, too. Thanks, guys. Thanks for that. Um, I happened to bring it up <laughs> on the show, so um, not like I wasn't fishing for it a little bit. But anyway, uh, again, you can continue to leave comments on my Facebook page, Matt Geica Media, on our Facebook page, The River's Edge. I had one comment over on Twitter as well from Lemuse67, who says he wants it pretty bad, like 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd power bad. I like that. You're talking my language there. Matalytics, the numbers. <laughs> yeah, it's all rather arbitrary. How bad do you want it? I don't know. It could change on a daily basis, right? Maybe you lose a couple of games or the Penguins lose a couple of games and you want it badly. You want it more badly. Or maybe that disengages you and that takes you away from it. And you say, ah, maybe next year, maybe the next couple of years, they'll get it done. And this goes back to what I was talking about around the trade deadline. The reason why I love the Derek Broussard acquisition was because it wasn't just about this year. It was about next year, too. He's also under contract next season. So even if things don't get, it, uh, don't get together late in this regular year or in the playoffs, if they can't figure it out, they'll have a, an entire full season next year with Crosby, Malkin, and Broussard down the middle. And with Crosby and Malkin getting up in age, I think it's, it's extremely wise. It's increasingly wise, even, to give them more support and allow for... Mike Sullivan to roll three lines when he can. That's why I love the idea of continuing to keep Phil Kessel with Derek Broussard and seeing if they can figure it out. My colleague at Pittsburgh Sport or Pittsburgh Hockey now, pardon, Dan Kingerski, doesn't believe that. Dan says, and Dan's been a guest on this show, but Dan says he would break that up, perhaps put Kessel with Crosby, try him there. That hasn't happened a lot. Maybe put Kessel with Malkin. That has worked, and that has happened a lot. In fact, just last year in the playoffs, it was a pretty deadly combination when you look at scoring chances for and against. So all those options there, and there are so many options for you to chime in on the show, and I, I thank you for that. Thanks for taking part in it. It's been a pleasure to bring it to you and uh, have a bit of a conversation here on the River's Edge. Okay, moving on. March Madness. This time of the year, that expression has become ubiquitous. You can't get away from people talking about their brackets and who they have winning and, oh, my bracket's busted. You heard about a lot of brackets busted this year because we had a 16 seed in uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, upset a one seed in Virginia. That's the first time that's ever happened in the men's tournament. It happened in the women's tournament about 15 years ago with Harvard, or 20 years ago with Harvard winning. I forget who they even beat. I remember Harvard um, got it done. You tend to remember when the Ivy League teams make things happen, at least I do. Uh, but you had that, you had, hey, my alma mater was in the tournament for the first time since 1987. You had them upsetting Wichita State uh, in the first round, at least before West Virginia showed them what for in the second round. And yes, all my former high school classmates who went to West Virginia, I understand. Yeah, the Mountaineers still run the state of West Virginia. I, I have never disputed that, whether it be football or basketball. But my question for you is, do all these upsets, do more upsets, do just more uncertainty and chaos in the tournament? Sure, that makes for a really fun opening weekend, but does it take away from your enjoyment now? Like, for instance, we saw Loyola Chicago, maybe the darling of the tournament, 
um, with Sister Jean, their chaplain, 98 years old, watching from the sidelines and cheering them on and getting post-game press conferences now. Um, is, it, is it too much in terms of the underdog and in terms of Cinderella coming through? At some point, don't you want to see maybe some of those traditional powers? And I suppose right now you still do. You have a Kentucky still alive. Uh, but even in that case, Kentucky lives off the one-and-done players, so we don't even really get a chance to get to know these players anymore in college sports. It's almost just like, okay, it's all about March Madness. It's not about the full season. It's not about understanding the great teams. It's not about seeing these teams build it up over two and three and four years, unless you are a mid-major who doesn't have teams or doesn't have players leaving early for the NBA. And in the case of the mid-majors, they don't always make it because they don't have the greatest talent. So you see a, a real churn when you look at the, the teams that make it and a real churn when you look at the players who are in there. So compared to 20 years ago when I first started watching college basketball, it just feels different. Yeah, it's thrilling to see and close games, buzzer beaters. It's uh, <clears throat> in the moment, really great. But then you get to the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight, and I don't know anything about Loyola Chicago. I just learned about them a week ago. It's like, it feels like microwave um, meals as opposed to a real slow cook and a slow burn, one that can um, build up loyalties or even hatreds in the case of like a Duke team in the past. And uh, they do have, <laughs> Duke still does have hateable players, Grayson Allen. We saw him grace the court in, uh, in Pittsburgh here at PPG Paints Arena just last week. But overall, these teams are more nameless and faceless. It's more you're just cheering for the brand or, um, or just going by habit and rooting against Kentucky and Duke and rooting for the underdog just by default. Does it make for a better tournament? I don't know. I don't think I like it as much. I, I just feel like there's less significance about these teams. I don't know as much about these teams because I'm not a complete diehard and the NCAA appears to be catering toward the casual fan by just making the first uh, weekend of it complete madness, to uh, borrow from their marketing slogan. But you get late in the tournament, I find my interest waning because I don't know as much about these teams and it feels fluky for some of these teams to be making it through. That's just me. That's just my opinion. What's your opinion on the NCAA tournament? For me, I like the NCAA hockey tournament more and more, partially because I've worked in college hockey for Robert Morris here in town back in the 14-15 season as their sports information officer. But uh, that feels more like it's rewarding a season's worth of work. To get an at-large bid in the, uh, the NCAA hockey tournament like Penn State did, yeah, you have to really be impressive the whole way through. You have to have uh, a great year. And even though Penn State is an, an underdog, so to speak, they're legit because they were one of the, uh, the 10 at-large teams. Only 16 teams make it, so it naturally winnows things down. And sure, you can get hot at the end of the year. We've seen it um, over and over again in college hockey. But uh, for the most part, it seems like just because the field is reduced down to 16 from the start, you know more about these teams if you follow college hockey, and there is more equality in the tournament. And um, like I was saying before the break, with all the controversies and with all the scandals surrounding college football and especially college basketball this year, I get turned off on the whole thing, not because players are, are being paid under the table, not because uh, coaches and agents are in cahoots and uh, there's all this payola going on to get players in certain spots, but because the NCAA continues to act like it's an amateur sport when it's not. Just admit it. Just say that these guys are semi-pro athletes, compensate them fairly above the table, in the open, and then I'll be more into it. I won't feel like... Uh, you're trying to pull the wool over my eyes. You're trying to make me believe something that isn't the case. I've had a hard time this year really getting over that. And partially uh, has uh, part of the reason, I should say, that I felt this way has been because of the pit coaching situation. You hire Kevin Stallings two years ago, and yeah, he had an awful season, but there were, there were no players left for him. Jamie Dixon stopped recruiting before he left, before he was uh, shown the door and went on to TCU and maybe bigger and better things. But uh, you spend millions of dollars on a coach. I realize that boosters provide much of that money, and much of it is endowment um, given directly to the athletic department. But as an institution of higher learning, to pay a coach installing several million dollars to go away what a waste of money. 
Um, college sports is, it is a business, but they're trying to continue to convince us that it's innocent and it's amateur. There's that disconnect there that really turns me off. So if Marshall hadn't made the tournament, as I mentioned, my dear alma mater, if they hadn't made the tournament for the first time since 87, um, I don't know if they'll, I don't know if I would have watched a single minute of the opening weekend of the tournament. And, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm logging off the, uh, March Madness platform and I'm getting into the NCAA hockey tournament which uh, for me is just more enjoyable to watch. I like hockey better than basketball, so I'm different in that way than a lot of people out there too. One final break on Geek Scott Game. When I come back, we'll wrap things up and uh, put a bow on the show, as I like to say. This is The River's Edge at riversedgepgh.com. Hey, it's Mike Sasson. Guess what? You used to love us at 10. You're going to love us even more at 9. It's me. It's Alex. It's funniness. It's guests. It's all sorts of me yelling into microphones only one hour earlier. It's exactly what you need at 9 o'clock. It's like a shot of adrenaline. It's the Mike Sasson Show, now starting at 9 o'clock on Tuesday on the River's Edge, a new kind of radio. Back in one last time at Mr. Small's Theater, in from the cold in Millvale. I am Matt Geica. This is the River's Edge. And thank you for finding us. RiversEdgePGH.com is your place for local music, local talk, combination of the two. Tyler Zelenko joins me. He's been on the ones and twos for the entire hour. But thanks again to uh, Brian Crawford for providing the platform and uh, get me involved with this thing three years ago. It has been a joy. In other podcast content that I've uh, produced this week, you can go to PittsburghHockeyNow.com to find this. It's right on our front page. But... My Big Picture podcast, which I record right here, and I appreciate the chance to do that. Studio quality sound is great, after all. But, um, yeah, a little cross-promotion here. I talked about, there were a couple of things that I discussed I couldn't quite get to on this show. You may have seen ESPN the magazine put out a list of the top 20 most dominant athletes of the last 20 years, which is the time span in which ESPN the magazine has existed. If you're a hockey fan, you probably looked into that and you said, how are there two drivers, one NASCAR, one open wheel, uh, three soccer players, two tennis players, no hockey players in this list? And the way it was positioned, I found disingenuous, believe it or not. I don't think ESPN hates hockey, but in this case, I think they got their calculations wrong. Uh, Peter Keating and the gang over there who put together their dominance index, quote unquote, for individual athletes. Um, I don't know how you can't include both Crosby and Ovechkin in that list. I went over the reasons why, and it's based on hard research. I'm not just saying this from the top of my head, um, but hockey players have more of an influence over their sport. Uh, The the top-of-the-line hockey players, the hockey stars, they have more of an influence on games than baseball stars do, and you had both Barry Bonds and Mike Trout on that list. I'd have knocked at least one of them out. Soccer, too. Um, uh, these guys barely get a chance to make uh, a difference in some games. So it's different from hockey in that way. I detailed all the reasons why on the Pittsburgh Hockey Now podcast network. So you can look at it there. And I was talking about the Flyers a little bit earlier today. Maybe the chance that the Penguins face them in the first round. The Flyers have had a rough march, but they're still right there to make the postseason. Don't write off the Flyers. They're one point behind the Penguins, so I'm guessing you probably haven't. But I also have seen plenty of fans say, Oh, they've lost 12 times in overtime and shootout. They're just there on loser points. That's the only reason they're up there in the standings. Well, also on Pittsburgh Hockey Now, I looked into this deeply, and the records in regulation between the Penguins and the Flyers, they're a lot closer than you might think. In fact, they're basically identical. So um, I examined that further. That's a tease for you, though. Pittsburgh Hockey Now, you can find that podcast and that story. A lot of Penguin stuff this time of the year, as you might imagine. But as I said earlier, I'll be covering the Pirates all season long for Pirates Prospects. And I have a story on George Contos, I think, a pivot man in that bullpen this year for the Bucks. We'll see um, how he can perform. A guy they picked up off waivers, suddenly a, uh, a very important player for them. And one that feels really under the radar for me this season. Hasn't been talked about a lot. But as we've seen, when the Pirates are good... They've had good bullpens because they've been able to make the most of their ability, whether it be in 2013, 14, or 15. Those were outstanding bullpens. Could Contos and Rivero match Watson and Melanson? That's a high bar to clear, but there's at least a chance, and I looked into why, for PiratesProspects.com. Thank you so much for tuning in to Geik Scott Game. 
again, it's a joy. Uh, here at age 33, I sit with you, thanking you for the birthday wishes and wishing you a happy weekend. This is Matt Geica reminding you that when the radio fades, you know life's moving fast. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next Friday right here in Millvale.